welcome, welcome to Oxford. Uh, as the title would suggest of this sort of taster lecture, this will be about thermodynamics of a vibrating bubble. The, my intent at least is to sort of give you a flavor of what an Oxford lecture is like. I believe this topic is supposed to be somewhat related to biomedical engineering, but hopefully you can see that in some sense this is a bit, could be viewed as a bit broader and that goes slightly beyond biomedical alone. Why are we interested in vibrating bubbles or oscillating bubbles uh, beyond the fact that that's an area of my research? Uh, it is basically a means of non-invasively concentrating energy within a body. So you can use it for things like diagnostic ultrasound. So you use bubbles to enhance contrast of sort of ultrasound uh, images. People use or are now proposing to use these types of bubbles for also doing various types of therapies. So you have ultrasound enhanced drug delivery. People are looking at something called sonodynamic therapy, whereby uh, uh, the, where the thermodynamics actually plays a huge role. And then people are also looking at sort of theranostics of using bubbles for both imaging and drug delivery. So all very much biomedically relevant, but uh, the concepts here can extend slightly beyond that. So give a quick overview of this lecture. I'm going to do my very best to complete in 30 minutes, ideally 25, and give you guys some time to ask questions, although I'm notoriously bad at keeping to time. Uh, the quick overview, I want to quickly define what thermodynamics is, uh, give some uh, definitions, some conventions that are used. We're going to quickly cover the first law of thermodynamics to sort of lay the foundation before we go into actually describing or at least at a very high level describing what a vibrating bubble is and how we make bubbles vibrate. I kind of gave away the answer in my uh, earlier introduction. And then lastly, kind of touch upon, hopefully as before you leave, on why we think it's important beyond the fact that some people will fund me for it. So there is, I, I, I believe, a lot of uh, potential in this type of technology. But it all is rooted into thermodynamics, which is effectively just simply the study of heat, work, and the interchange between heat and work. Um, you'll notice that I've sort of listed some or bolded some words. We've got heat. So heat is really just energy in transport. You can imagine, uh, we typically use the letter Q for heat and it will have units of joules, but we can imagine heat as sort of like your campfire, right? I can stick my hand above the campfire and I will feel the heat emanating from it. I can see, I can feel the heat either through radiation, through convection, or through conduction, but the point of the matter is it is energy that is in sort of transport. Then there's also work. So work, which we will maybe uncreatively call W, is also in the units of joules, also units of energy, is effectively work is done when a force is applied to something to make it move some distance or maybe change its shape. So again, to quick, get a quick analogy, if I have a balloon and I blow the balloon up, I've applied some form of work um, either uh, to it or work is applied to me when, when maybe I'm squeezing the balloon or, or something of that nature. So it's something physical that is interacting typically with the boundary of the system to sort of change its shape, its volume, its density, some sort of physical property of it. And last thing which I haven't really written down here is sort of what ties it all together which is the internal energy of a given system. So internal energy you can think of it of as if I were to look, so maybe unsurprisingly, just to complete this, it's also units of joules, but if I were to look at a cookie with the various I don't know, chocolate chips in it or whatever, right? And I were to look at all of the intermolecular bonds between the starches, the sugars, the fats, that was, et cetera, et cetera, all, all the way down to the vibrational aspects of the individual molecules and I were to sum all of that together, I would get the internal energy of that cookie. Maybe crudely speaking, it's the number of calories and whatever it is that you're consuming, right? That's the amount of energy that is in the system, innately in the system. So why do we, so now that we have some means of describing what thermodynamics is in a little bit more rigorous way, we can clearly see that between heat, work, and the internal energy, that is fundamental to everything. Uh, everything in the universe 
what's underpinning it is effectively the thermodynamics of a given system. And this is true when you're talking about combustion reactions, is equally true as when I eat that cookie and I convert that into energy through some sort of biological process. It's always governed by, ultimately, the thermodynamics. And I noticed, I, I mentioned a, a word in, in that statement called a system. It, it's the thermodynamics of a system. In this case, the cookie is a system, right? This room could be a system. So what is a system? Maybe some more definitions. Well, effectively, a system is some arbitrary thing we define that is separate from the surroundings, and it's separated from the surroundings by some surface or boundary. So I have the universe here, right? And I arbitrarily pick some volume within it, and whatever that is, I call my system be it the cookie or a person in this room or whatever, right? And then anything outside of it is the surroundings. And then this sort of surface is our control surface. And really we're now looking at the interaction between the surroundings acting on to the system. And we can sort of think of three different types of systems. We can first think of an isolated system. All right, so they're in, sealed away in some mystical box. And it's isolated from its surroundings, meaning, so what does that mean? Well, it means that I can't interact with it. I can't impose any work onto it, or I can't extract work from it. I can't add or remove any heat from it. And lastly, I actually can't add or remove any mass as well. So that is a system that is in isolation. It is, well, as the name would suggest, you know, secluded from its surroundings in such a way that there is no way for the surroundings to interact with it. There's a second type of system that we might be interested in, which is a closed system. I might add that an isolated system is pretty trivial. It's not one we'll probably delve too much into, but it is, in principle, in existence. The second one is a closed system, whereby maybe it's not as isolated. The biggest difference here is that work can be done to the system or from the system. And similarly, heat can be added or removed from that system. but we cannot add or remove any mass from that system. So the last one maybe is the least constrained. It's an open system, and as that might suggest, all it implies is that now we can start adding or removing mass from that system. So there's a general convention when we're dealing with these thermodynamic systems, and it's a convention meaning that of course, not everybody uses it, so you do have to be a bit careful if you are perusing different textbooks what convention they use. Typically, we say that for a given system, if heat is supplied from the surroundings to the system, then that heat is positive. In Converse, if the system is applying work to the surroundings, then we say work is positive. But again, that's not always true. So usually the more contentious bit is this. So sometimes they say the reverse is true. So just check um, if you ever do look this up. So another thing we want to talk about is thermodynamics is all about the interchange between heat and work and this internal energy in a given system. But to do that requires a process, and that process requires sort of a path. So if I have a system in state A, and I want to bring that system to state B, how I go from A to B or the individual steps to get there is the process. For example, I can light a fire, or I can use my hands to squeeze it, or something like that. So there are many ways. I can go to like 1, 2, all the way down to B. 
Okay, so each motion is that is a process that I use in a given system, and the journey I take to get to A to B is the path. So maybe from step to one I add heat, and maybe in this step I take away some work or something like that. Now, if I can find a way to go from B back to A, this process is a reversible process. Doesn't necessarily mean that I have to go back the exact same way, but if I can somehow always get back to the original state, then it's a reversible process. If I cannot, then it's irreversible. And of course, there are many different types of processes that I can do on a given system, but I'm going to limit it to two for this particular taster lecture. So we can look at an adiabatic process in which we can say that the heat or the change in heat of the given from A to B or whatever is zero. Okay? So there's no change in heat in a given system. And this next one of particular interest is isothermal, which hopefully, as the name gives away, would imply that the temperature is constant in the process. So I go from, you know, I'm driving my car, I want it to be 25 degrees Celsius, and I'm driving from the top of a mountain to the bottom, I'm somewhere in the Rockies, and I can tell you from personal experience, it'll go from, you know, minus 10 at the top of the Rockies down if it's a summer day to as high as like 30, right? But the inside is, during that journey, is still 25 the whole way through, right? So from my system perspective, it's an isothermal process. And there are ways I can cycle through these systems and, and do all sorts of fun stuff in order to extract work for a given system. So you can think of like combustion engines and what have you. All right. So what is then the first law? So the first law effectively is simply stated as energy in a system is conserved. That is, I can't just magically create energy and I can't really destroy energy. Again, going back to the topic of thermodynamics, it's about the interchange between heat and work. Right? I can't magically create heat and I can't magically create work. I must sort of exchange it from a given system or extract it or push it into the surroundings. So a more formal definition is really that in any given closed system, undergoing some kind of cyclical process, the net work delivered to the surroundings is equal to the net heat taken away from the surroundings, which is effectively saying I can only convert between the two. A slightly even more formal way of describing this is we can look at the given heat given to the system with the work from the surroundings is going to be equal to the total energy or the internal energy of that system. And of course I can sort of look at this in a differential form which is slightly more useful. And what you can quickly notice is that both of these are sort of path dependent, right? Remember, or process dependent. I want to go from A to B. And depending on how I get there, right, the path will tell me what the DQs and DWs are at each given different step. But my internal energy at A and U internal energy at B are both path independent. It doesn't matter how I get there. Right? I will always arrive at U of B. So that internal energy is path independent. So to formalize some more definitions, at least to put it down to something, some expression that we can sort of think about a bit more, let's look at our W, our work, which is boundary work. It's if I want to change the volume of something, I have to shift its surface, its control surface. I have to somehow adjust in some way. So in order to do that I have to enact a force and we all know that force for a given area over per unit area is pressure. So it's going to be related to the pressure acting on the system over whatever that change in volume is resulting from that change in pressure or that addition of pressure or removal of. 
So we can go look at A to B at some pressure dV. The internal energy is a little bit more complicated. Uh, not, not in an expression, but in its concept. So we need to somehow add up all of the energy that could, all the motion of all of the atoms and molecules and all the different things that could exist in a given system. Not that easy to do, but fortunately, we can look at the number of moles in that given system. And we can look at what is known as the constant volume heat capacity, or you know, how much energy can that given system store per unit mole, or arrange it to be per unit mass if so desired. And that's going to be proportional to how much, uh, what the change in temperature may be. <coughs> So now we are, I think, fully equipped to start looking at this vibrating bubble. Okay? We've covered some definitions. We've covered the first law. And so now we can start looking at what happens in a vibrating bubble, or in fact, how does one cause a bubble to vibrate. So broadly speaking, and in this community, this can sometimes be a bit uh, contentious, but effectively, for now, we're going to assume that a bubble is any gas cavity surrounded by a liquid, which is quite nice if thermodynamically, because we have a very isolated, I shouldn't say isolated, we have a very closed system that is a gas, and we have a liquid that acts as our surroundings, right? Now, it's closed because the gas for the most part, let's assume, can't magically diffuse into the surrounding liquid and no dissolved gas can diffuse back in. Um, of course, in, in reality, that's not true. But for the sake of this argument, let's, let's hold on to that assumption. And it's very nice because it's a gas, meaning it's highly compressible. In fact, we're going to assume that it's an ideal gas, which, of course, you probably remember means that the pressure and volume are related to each other by some constant, and of course you probably remember this as that being what the constant is, uh, but really we can just now relate sort of the pressure being just some constant over some volume. So they're inversely proportional to one another, right? That's really important because that implies that if I increase the pressure, I can get a decrease in the volume. Again, think of the balloon. A balloon is like a bubble-ish. If I add pressure to it, I decrease the volume. If I release that pressure, the volume then expands. It, and there's a, some sort of um, increase in volume. But so how do I create a, if I want to vibrate it, I have to oscillate between two pressures. And what's the best way to do that? Well, effectively, it's what I'm doing right now when I'm speaking to you. I'm oscillating the air. And you're getting different pressure regimes. And based on that sort of modulating amplitude and frequency, you are interpreting that as my voice. And you're interpreting that as basically it's just sound. I can do the same thing in water, except water is brilliant in that it is, for the most part, incompressible. So that pressure wave sort of travels without disturbing too much of the liquid itself. So I can really just think of it as the bubble being situated in an isotropic pressure change as I transmit a sound wave through the water. So effectively, if I'm looking at time, and I have some hydrostatic pressure, I'm not applying any sort of sound wave to it, and I apply a sound wave to it, then I should get a similar volumetric response, but inversely proportional to the pressure. So I'll get something that looks like this. And now if you recall, if I am changing its volume, and there's some pressure change, then I'm doing work onto the system. And therefore, the bubble, at least the gas inside, is now going to be governed by thermodynamics. Well, everything is governed by thermodynamics, but it's more obvious in this case. In fact, I did a simulation of this really quickly, of an oscillating bubble. And here, sure enough, I'm changing it by roughly one atmosphere. Uh, and I get a, a fairly similar response, uh, conceptually matching what I described earlier. You'll notice that it is not exactly the same. This increases, uh, or rather, the volume increases by 10%, but doesn't decrease by 10%. Uh, 
That's because obviously water imparts some amount of inertia. The gas will have some sort of resistive pressure to whatever I'm acting on it. And the bubble will have something known as surface tension induced pressure, which is also known as Laplace pressure. So, but the point being that conceptually we're on the right mark. So what happens in the vibrating bubble from a thermodynamic point of view? There will be two cases we will look at. We will look at the isothermal case and an adiabatic case. So if you recall, here I'm going to try to speed up a bit. Now isothermal implies that there's no change in temperature. No change in temperature means that the internal energy can't change. So from our first law, we quickly see that our heat must be equal to our work. So a real question is, if I want the bubble to be isothermal, how much heat must I exchange from the environment? And if you recall, this is just going to be equal to, but from this relationship, we know that pressure is inversely related to volume. And so quickly, through some algebraic manipulations, you'll get that the heat should be proportional to some constant times ln of, OK. <coughs> All I'm really saying here is that as I am going through the cycle during compression, I need to pull heat away. And during expansion, I need to add heat in. Otherwise, it's no longer isothermal. And sure enough, I did that simulation once again. And here's the same bubble oscillating. Uh, and you'll see here, of course, some of the initial ring up and ring, some details that maybe are not important. But the point is, I'm trying to make here is if I were to look at this point and compare to the next cycle here and sum up all the changes of heat at every incremental step of the bubble moving, and you sum them all together, you'll get a net heat of about zero. Which makes sense because I started out with no heat being exchanged to and from, from state A, and I go back to state A again, which is no heat. So that makes sense. So the next one is the adiabatic case. So adiabatic implies, again, that our Q is zero, but similarly dQ is equal to zero. So now our work is equal to our internal energy, so we get this from the previous expressions. Uh, again, we can now relate pressure to volume as we did before. We realize that it's inversely proportional. Um, and basically, through some additional manipulations, we'll see this relationship to be true. And what we see here is actually the exact opposite of what is happening. So as I compress the bubble, the temperature should increase. And as I expand the bubble, the temperature should decrease. Again, this should sort of follow intuition if you think about the ideal gas law, which makes sense because this is based on an ideal gas. And of course, I once again did that simulation. And what we see is during the expansion, so that's expansion, we get a drop in temperature. And then we do a compression. And we get an increase in temperature. What's interesting to note, in this case, for the adiabatic, assuming the bubble can oscillate adiabatically, that the temperature swing is quite drastic. So at its peak compression, its temperature is 50 degrees Celsius. And at its peak expansion, it's minus you know, 10. So if there was any water vapor in there, it would immediately condense out and liquefy. Obviously, um, this doesn't happen in real life. In reality, a bubble oscillating at the frequency that I perturbed it at, at, at the uh, amplitude of pressure that I'm perturbed at will be completely isothermal. And again, the reason for that is now, if we're wanting to distinguish between the case of an adiabatic system and an isothermal system, it's about how fast can that heat enter or exit the bubble. So if the bubble moves faster than the rate at which the heat can enter or leave, effectively, it's adiabatic. 
right? Heat can't enter fast enough and it can't leave fast enough. So the gas just views it as an adiabatic system. But if it's moving relatively slowly, there's more than enough time for heat to enter or leave, and then it behaves isothermally. So in this case, it behaves isothermally. But, of course, I mentioned earlier, obviously, I want to sort of add a bit of energy and do some biomedical science. I take it to the extreme. Instead of one atmosphere of perturbations, I do four atmospheres, or, or no, like two point something atmospheres of perturbation. And now I'm getting the bubble to uh, rapidly expand and then even more rapidly compress. In fact, it compresses so fast it breaks the speed of sound in water and it effectively collapses in on itself and then it transitions from an isothermal process to an adiabatic process. In fact, it's so adiabatic and the compression is so insane and the, the model can't actually really predict it that the bubble goes from about 25 degrees Celsius and spikes up to about 6,500 degrees Celsius, which is starting to border the temperature of the sun. In fact, it's so hot that uh, we use this sort of process to enact a lot of the drug delivery or, or the sonodynamic therapy that I was sort of alluding to earlier. And that's why it's so interesting is what happens in these regimes and what we can do sort of in application, how we take advantage of it. So here is what we typically do in this sense. We use sound in bubbles, either exogenous or endogenous bubbles, to sort of deliver patients to treatment. No, treatments to patients, not patients to treatment. And what we use is ultrasound, really high frequency sound waves. The previous sound waves I was using were one megahertz. And we force bubbles to collapse in on themselves. And they collapse in so violently that they generate a little bit of light. That's known as sonoluminescence. That light might go out and hit a molecule that is photosensitive. So it goes from an inert to a toxic species in the presence of light. So we can get sort of targeted drug delivery that way. You are generating such a high temperature, that nearly of that of the surface of the sun, that all of the molecules, all of the molecules that are in that gas completely dissociate. They just break up and then it's musical chairs during the expansion. And that we create lots of different reactive oxygen species because there's lots of oxygen in our body. And that also can lead directly to uh, sonodynamic therapy, but it turns out that if you have a lot of ROS, it sensitizes tumors to chemotherapy. So it's another way to sort of redu reduce the drug loading for chemotherapy. And then lastly, as you can imagine, these are moving very, very quickly, it perturbs the liquid around it, the collapse emits shock waves, and all these mechanical effects can enhance drug delivery, uh, open up barriers in the body like the blood-brain barrier, and also induce things like hysteric trips, you're just literally breaking the tissue down, or the, uh, the, the viscous dampening uh, causes, gets converted to heat, and then you get sort of a thermal ablation. So with that, I have landed within the 30 minute timeline, but I have about three minutes left for questions for anyone in the room that might have a question. Thanks.